أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله الطاهرين وعلى أصحابه المنتجبين وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون صدق الله العلي العظيم In the name of Allah most gracious most merciful all praise is due to our creator our cherisher our nourisher and our sustainer we bear witness there's none worthy of worship but Allah we bear witness we believe in all the prophets who came throughout history and we bear witness that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is the final of all the emissaries and messengers of Allah. So as elders, Imma, Hufad, beloved brothers and sisters, youth, at this auspicious hour of Jummah in this beautiful house of Allah, I greet you with the Islamic universal greeting of peace. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah be upon each and everyone present here and all those listening and all those viewing. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. We are in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal, the month of the birth of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And 53 years ago this week, a congregation at a masjid was waiting for their imam to conduct the Mawlud program in that masjid. But sadly, the imam never turned up and the congregation was at Al Jami'a Masjid in Stichman Road, Claremont here in Cape Town. And the imam was Imam Abdullah Harun. He did not turn up because he was arrested by the apartheid security police on Mawlud Eve, then held without trial, kept in solitary confinement, tortured to death, and his bruised body was returned to his family 123 days afterwards on the 27th of September 1969. An inquest is currently being reopened to investigate his death. We are also now in the month of September, a difficult month etched into our memorial calendar, a month of painful recollection in which people of significance were taken away from us. We remember the Novo Siochi massacre in September 1992 when our Muslim Bosnian brothers and sisters were massacred and killed by the Serbs. We remember the 16th to 18th of September in 1982, 40 years ago this week, where over 3,000 Muslims were brutally slain and killed in the Sabra and Shatila camps in Lebanon at the hands of Christian Lebanese militia aided by the Israeli armor. That massacre was so brutal that body parts were stoned everywhere, left there for days, and in, eventually the people were unable to identify which part of the body belonged to which person, and they buried all of them together in a mass grave and sealed it off. 16 September 1931, one of the heroes against the fight against colonialism, like Twanguru, like Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, a heroic personality in North Africa, the lion of the desert, Umar al-Mukhtar, 16 September 1931, was publicly executed outside the Suluk prison in Libya by the ruthless and cowardly occupying Italian armed forces. And as people of this beautiful land of South Africa, September is the month in which some of our struggle heroes were needlessly removed from us. Suleiman Saluji, 9 September 1964, Steve Bantubiko, 12 September 1977, and of course, a Shaheed Imam Abdullah Harun, 27 September 1969. 
Each of them were principal standard bearers for social justice. All of them were victims of a brutal racist apartheid system that took their lives. And every one of them strived for a better future for all. And they paid with their lives for a cause greater than themselves. Man aasha li nafsihi aasha saghira wa maata saghira wa nasiyahu al-naas. Man aasha li ghayrihi aasha kabira wa maata kabira wa dhakarahu al-naas. The Arabs have a saying, whoever lives from this for themselves live a small life, die a small death and are soon forgotten. But those who live for a cause greater than themselves, they live a great life. They die a memorable death and they are remembered long after they are gone. And if you look at the current situation, the status quo is a betrayal of the legacy of these great ones. It's a smear on our heritage of struggle against oppression and injustice. When we reflect on where we are and we realize how far we are slipping away from the ideals for which many people fought and died, our land is riddled with crime and corruption. There seems to be no person that has been unaffected by crime and everyone in some way is a victim of some degree of corruption. Deadly violence is the norm in our land. Extortion, kidnapping for ransom, coordinated robberies, organized violence is the order of the day. People are traumatized more so as the days go by. People are traumatized to the point where they do not feel safe and secure anymore. What are you supposed to do when your aged parents are murdered before your eyes in their homes? Or people are robbed at gunpoint in their shops? Business people are kidnapped for ransom. A sister or a daughter is attacked in public. Each one of us living in daily fear of being carjacked every time we stop at the stop street or at the red traffic light. Violence has become the norm and insecurity has become part of our culture. The criminals ro roam free and the law-abiding citizens live in fenced homes behind security gates and burglar bars. No one seems to be held accountable for this criminality. State coffers, by the way, it's our taxes. It's not easy. You can't be indifferent to this. It's our money being used. It's our money being stolen. State coffers, which is our tax money, is looted to the tune of billions of rands every year. And no one seems to be held accountable. Criminals commit crime in broad daylight. A young member of the Jamaat, Khalid Parker, whose father is a senior member, senior official of this masjid where I'm speaking here to Quds, was gunned down in the center of a busy public road in the middle of the day in broad daylight. Laying in a pool of blood, laying in a pool of blood through the time of Juma on Imam Abdullah Harun Road. On Imam Abdullah Harun Road. Is this not a direct insult? to the legacy of Imam Abdullah Harun and to the noble struggle of those who fought for justice. This is not the South Africa that Imam Harun died for. And if we are not going to protect each other, then Allah admonishes us in Surah Anfal that if the forces of goodness do not combine their efforts to set things right, إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوا تَكُمْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ Then there will be trials, miseries and major corruption. Major crimes are committed blatantly and no one gets caught. There's a culture of unashamed criminality without consequences, without accountability, without fear of retribution, without even fear of being arrested or identified. Criminals are just roaming with impunity and law-abiding citizens are living in debilitating fear. There are over five and a half thousand carjackings in the past year. In other words, every day 15 that has become the norm. 
4,100 children were kidnapped last year, which means a child somewhere goes missing every five hours. How? Where? Why? How come? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrated in a tradition. A tradition which relayed from Nabi Isa Alayhi Salam, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ When there's no sense of accountability, when there's no sense of shame, then people tend to do just as they please. When there's no sense of accountability, no sense of shame, then people tend to do just as they please. Most people, more than almost 30 years after our first elections, most people are experiencing feelings of helplessness, feelings of hopelessness. No one walks carefree anymore. No one sleeps safely as before. The problem of crime in South Africa affects every citizen in this land. And it's not only a judicial matter. It has to do with ethics. It has to do with values. It has to do with morality. Those principles that people lived and fought and died for, people seem to lack a sense of respect for human life and people seems to have no value for human property. The majority of us South Africans believe rightfully that after 1994, the first elections, a better life will be delivered for all South Africans. But the opposite is happening here. Today, apart from the corrupt who are still walking free, millions of people are now disillusioned, angry, frustrated, and many are worse off than they were before. We are living, by the way, in an African continent, a continent blessed with gold. I spoke last week, the Queen passed away. They have the second highest reserves of gold in the world. And England doesn't have a gold mine. We have all the gold in the world, but we are bankrupt. Gold, diamonds, platinum, coal, uranium, iron ore, valuable resources and resources. Despite all of this, the inhabitants of this land and of this continent continue to be among the poorest in the world, most mired in poverty. Why does the continent with such an abundance of natural resources, which Allah has given to us, why does such an abundance of natural resources have so little effect on his people's quality of life? We are living in a beautiful country of South Africa. I've been to many countries. South Africa is by far the most beautiful country in the world. The freest country in the world, freedom of religion, which you don't have in 99% of the countries of the world. Freedom of expression, freedom of association. A country, because of the struggles of people like Imam Abdullah Harun and so on, a country which lauded with a lauded constitution. Our constitution is said to be among the best. A majestic legacy of struggle against apartheid that produced magnificent liberation stalwarts and freedom fighters. Yet it remains the most unequal country in the world. Perhaps we are where we are because state resources have been misused and abused and power abused by those using their struggle credentials. Just because you're involved in the struggle doesn't give you a right to theft and to looting. Using their struggle credentials to benefit a few while the majority who keep them in power are yet to see the rays of liberation and are burdened in squalor, in poverty and in degradation. We are held captive by reality here in South Africa that suffers from a crime epidemic where we have an incredibly weak, evidently corrupt, seemingly inefficient government with a reprehensible, timid attitude towards com combating criminality and corruption. Many of our polit political leaders have betrayed their solemn commitment to build a free and fair society in a post-apartheid South Africa. They have deviated from the goal of meeting the needs of the poorest of the poor and alleviating the sufferings of the impoverished, of the impoverished and the disadvantaged. Vast majority of our people 
are still living in abject poverty grounds perhaps for a coming revolution. We are in a society where many are still con victims of unaddressed injustices and then afforded the opportunity to be able to survive and live and develop and empower themselves with dignity. Some are so engrossed in enjoying their lives and privileges that they have forgotten about the rights of other people. Our beautiful country, with all its tremendous potential, is held back by entrenched leadership, manifesting a culture of corruption, a culture of incompetence, and an attitude of complacency and a mindset of indifference. In the words of the greatest leader of all time, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam who said, خِيَارُ أَئِمَّتِكُمُ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّ تُحِبُّونَهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَكُمْ The best of your leaders are those whom you love and they love you. Love, you can't even trust the people. If we are not vigilant and conscientious, then we may unfortunately end up in a situation that we do not want to be in. In fact, we are already there. With an incompetent, unsuitable leaders that perhaps we deserve for our complacency. And if we elect, if we elect incompetent, corrupt, self-serving politicians to positions of political leadership, then we are not victims of the state, but we are accomplices to their crimes. We have many leaders, you see, but not, we do not have leadership. We have many leaders, but not leadership. Leadership in Islam, you see, is a trust, it's an amana, carrying great, tremendous responsibility. And the true primary roles of leadership, among others, the primary roles is that of being a servant leader and a guardian leader. It's attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith documented by Ibn Asakir. That the Rasul said, Sayyidul Qawm Khadimhum. The leader of the people does not serve his own interests. The leader of the people serves the interest of the people. We don't see that. Then there is the guardianship part. Besides serving the interest of people, you must guard and protect their well-being, their interest. They put you in power, they gave you the authority to make decisions on their behalf, to lead on their behalf, to spend the taxes we give you. The guardian leader, Rasul said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyya. Each and every one of you is a guardian to another, and each one will be held accountable for those under their care. And great leaders fulfill both, if not at least one of these two, neither of which we see in our country. You see, we need competent, committed leaders who will take this country far forward, far removed from state capture, from incompetence, from criminality, from poverty, from societal violence, from a stagnant economy, in fact, a retrogressing economy, from a better means of being able to survive in decreasing the cost of living if possible, from these rising fuel prices, dropping rand value, from unemployment, from load shedding. Load shedding. Load shedding is a direct result of incompetence in our country and corruption. Nothing else. Absolutely nothing else. We're still selling power to our neighbors at a price lower than we can afford. Load shedding is a direct result of sins of commission and sins of omission. Commission, evident theft of resources. And omission, years of neglect. Not prioritizing the power sources and the power means whereby people have access to this. So much mis mismanagement of funds, so much theft of allocated monies, the things are not even working anymore. In some areas, we have such bad potholes that we do not drive on the left-hand side of the road, we drive on what is left of the road. 
You see, during the anti-apartheid struggle, one of the main shouts was Amandla Awetu, power to the people. With ESCOM, the people have no power at all. Addressing the Africa Renewable Investment Summit, which is taking place right now in Cape Town here, Cape Town's ESCOM CEO said, Andre De Reiter, and I quote, we may actually see stage 15 load shedding. I can't even count so high. We may see stage 15 load shedding. You see, we survived the pandemic, but wonder whether we will survive load shedding. We have removed our face masks. It seems that now we may start wearing headlamps. But let's reflect on how our heroic struggle for liberation in this country, how noble the struggle, how valiant the efforts of people. And look where self-serving, corrupt, incompetent leaders have landed us. How did we get from the likes of Luthule, Subukwe, Steve Biko, Imam Harun, to where we are, Rahim Musa? How did we end up from all of those people, Imam? How did we end up to where we are? Instead of confidence, we have doubt. Instead of hope, we have despair. Instead of safety, we have crime. Instead of security, we have corruption. Instead of service, we have empty promises. Instead of leaders, we have thieves. This is certainly not what Subukwe fought for. What Biko, Dr. Hafiji, Ahmed Timol, Imam Harun fought and died for. During the heat of struggle and the height of repression, we stayed and braved imprisonment, detentions, exiles, bannings. We did not consider ever permanently leaving our country, our beloved country. If we were to go to empower ourselves, to find connections, how can we fight against this system? Because we were determined to see the fruits of the struggle from the tree of liberation, which was nurtured by the blood of our martyrs. Now, so many people are determined to leave South Africa. Apartheid couldn't drive us away, but our elected leaders and the incompetence and the allowing of crime and corruption is making so many people who are generally an in integral part of the struggle who feel we don't know where we can go, but we don't know, we don't want to be here. How can that be? The hand of Sheikh Yusuf, of Tuanguru, Ghadi Abdul Salam, land of Sufi side, great ones, great legacy, great heroes. How did we end up like this? How did we allow ourselves to get to where we are? You see, this is not what Imam Harun strived for, nor died for. Let's just sit back and think. When you look at the best of our legacy. Imam Abdullah Harun was a Hafiz al-Quran. He was an alim, a maharib al-hurriya, a freedom fighter, a mujahid, a revolutionary who fought for justice, an imam of the Unifah Masjid, a leader, a da'i, a propagator of Islam, a mu'allim, one who taught others, and eventually a shaheed, one who paid with his life for the cause of truth, for freedom of the oppressed, for justice in the name of Allah. How dare we allow the fruits of their labor to be tarnished with our indifference? How dare we betray their noble legacy by normalizing crime and corruption as part of our daily life? How dare we cheapen their blood, which is the ultimate sacrifice with such betrayal that we are allowing to be perpetuated. We are a people who keep our history alive and we are proud of that. We do Maulud. We do remember Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar. We do commemorate Tuanguru, Qadi Abdul Salam. We do commemorate our, our hero, Sufi Sahib. We still feel the pain of Imam Harun's death this week, 53 years after his passing. And all of these should evoke within us a moral responsibility 
in our collective conscience as people of this land to ensure that the blood of martyrs was never spilled in vain. You see, when we forget our noble ones, we begin drifting away from our moral compass and from our spiritual roots. And without moral direction, without a spiritual foundation, we have no base to grow and reap the fruits of the legacy of our heroes. I conclude by asking all of us to seriously reflect and see and decide and motivate your institutions and organizations as to what we can do. We gave our lives, some people gave their lives, went to prison, went to prison. What are we leaving for our children? In our lifetime, we saw this thing going haywire. Allah will ask us, what did you do? You see something wrong? Change it physically. If you cannot do something physically to change it, at least speak out against it. If you cannot even do that, at least don't feel comfortable with the wrongs that you are seeing. Dislike it at least in your heart. And that is the lowest expression of your faith. I ask all of us to recite Fatiha on the ruh of all those who have passed on. Uh, and also specifically uh, in this week on the ruh of Imam Abdullah Harun. A man dedicated to living by what is right, fighting for what is just. A man who aided and uplifted so many people in his lifetime, who had the courage of conviction to stand up against oppression, who laid down his life in a cause of justice and whose life continues to inspire all of us. Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim.